Okay, so we're recording. Okay. All right, so, um, so with that introduction, I'm going to focus on one particular document today. And Paula also, we've got, I think, lots of words of wisdom coming from Paula. Um, but why is this particular document worthy of a program of you spending your morning, um, your hour before lunch on this topic? Um, okay, so in, okay, this is our information. So I think I can go past that. Um, basic estate plan, often it will include a trust. It might include just a will, or it would include the pour over will together with the trust. A very good advanced healthcare directive is important. Um, the privacy waiver HIPAA, maybe a post form with a married couple, perhaps a community property agreement, maybe not. So these are all typical um, documents that would be in a basic estate plan, but the financial power of attorney, as much as it, it it's usually just tucked in there, it's really important. Um, so the way I visualize um, when I'm describing a financial power of attorney, I imagine that I have just signed a great um, estate plan. It's got all those basics in it. It's got everything I wanted to have in it. And I decide I feel so good. I'm going to take my dog out for an early afternoon walk. Walking down the street, um, I I'm looking at the birds, I'm looking at the flowers, and I trip over a crack in the sidewalk. And I hit my head. Next thing I know, I end up in the hospital. Um, I, I'm in the hospital. So I need, so, and I have this great financial power of attorney. I have asked somebody, let's see, just wanna skip to, um, oh, I'm sorry. Um, so I've asked somebody to step in my shoes. I've said, boy, I need to call my insurance company and file and, and get some help with my insurance. Or I need to, um, my taxes are due next week and I can't sign my tax return because I'm stuck in the hospital. Or I'm concerned my pg and &E is gonna be, um, it's gonna be turned off because my bill is due or my mortgage is due, or I'm supporting somebody in the family and that check needs to get to my grandchild so um, he can you know, pay for school or pay for supplies, whatever it might be. So the financial power of attorney in that document I am appointing somebody, because this is my document, so I'm appointing somebody to be my voice, to get on the phone and talk to my insurance company on my behalf, to be my hand, to sign that check for PG&E, or sign my tax return, be my ears, you know, listen to what's going on, um, be my eyes, read documents for me. Um, if I've, you know, I've not only hit my head, I broke my arm, I can't write, um, I'm asking somebody to be me, to step in my shoes. Um, and with, with that, um, I've, you know, I, I have to be careful or, or aware of who I am appointing to be all of these things because it is very potentially powerful. I also note, because this is sometimes confusing for people, the financial power of attorney only works during your lifetime, right? Because I've got my hand, my ears, my voice today. If I've passed away, these I don't use these, um, I, I'm not, my body's not being used anymore. So the power of attorney stops at death. So if somebody, I, I've had clients say, you know, I've tried to go to the bank. My, my mother passed last week and I'm trying to use the power of attorney. It's not going to work. Um, you might be able to slip it in and work, but legally it's not supposed to work anymore. So again, so what kind of, um, when is the power of attorney used and I touched on it a little bit, it could be very, very um, concise. It could be very basic, um, not too detailed, or the financial power of attorney could go into a lot more depth. It could be a document used to make sure bills are paid, um, manage my investments potentially, deal with beneficiary forms, potentially tax matters. It could be more complex. Um, a, a financial power of attorney, if you want or need more direction in that document, or you want that document to give your agent, the person you're appointing, more powers, you need to specifically add those powers. So gifting, for example, it could be, again, um, 
end of the year and I want to make sure my gift gets to um, to Avenidas and to my grandchildren and to my uh, friend. And it, if I can't write that check, I need to specifically in my power of attorney say, my agent has the right to gift on my behalf. Or it could be, um, this gifting could be for more significant, significance, the wrong word, more um, momentous kind of planning. It could be that I am worried about future tax at my, at my death, or I'm trying to set up irrevocable trusts. Um, so the power of attorney could allow for gifting and potentially transfer of assets if that's what we want, um, or if that's what I would want. Um, I'm gonna pause here and say what a financial power of attorney does not do. So you all may know this, but if you have a trust and you have certain assets in your trust, so let's say this is me talking, it's my trust, I've got my house in my trust, I've got my brokerage account at Morgan Stanley is titled in my trust. And in my trust, I've got my elder son as my successor trustee. Let's say with that power of attorney, I sign it on the same day, but I decide my younger son is the right person to be my agent for my financial power of attorney. And my younger son says, I'm gonna help mom deal with her Morgan Stanley account. He's not gonna have the right to do that because Morgan Stanley is over on the side in my trust. It's gonna be my elder son who has the power to deal with the Morgan Stanley account because it's in the trust. My younger son could deal with my Bank of America account. That's just, it's, it's a checking account and it, it's not in the trust. He can help me with the Bank of America account. So when you're um, considering what are these powers that I might be giving or that I need to give to somebody, consider who is being appointed to serve in these roles and um, what is it that you're asking them to do to make sure that it really, it works. Um, Paula, I know I'm gonna, I'll keep going, but do you want me to talk about real life scenarios yeah. now? Yeah, let's just, um, I think Shirley, uh, we have a member named Shirley who wanted to have a question. I just wanna remind people, we're keeping everybody muted because we have so many people and sometimes we can hear background noise. So post your questions in the chat line and I will, um, we'll stop along the way and we'll, um, I'll read your questions and we'll ask them. Okay. And I think oh. Shirley uh, had a question, but I, she hasn't posted it yet. Okay. So, um, I, I, so we're talking about how to decide who to appoint and that decision-making process and why. Um, and on these forms, uh, you have the options for three designees. I think that's a correct term. You're appointing a designee, one, two, three. And um, a lot of people are calling me and talking to me about the fact that they're trying to find, um, you know, a trusted relative and then also somebody younger. Uh, there, I think COVID woke everybody up here about looking at the reality of what can happen and if things are unexpected and if, and in some situations, if the caregiver is hospitalized and the care recipient who has dementia and is at home and needs total supervision, who's going to step in? So that was the most common question I was asked during COVID. It was from solo agers and from solo caregivers. So Lori Langdon does have a question. Does financial power of attorney allow the named person to sign checks on a regular non-trust account? Yeah, so, um, so two parts to this. So Paula, your note about agents, and can you just hold that question so I can comment on the agent sure. piece? Yeah. Okay, and just so I don't forget that line of thought. So with yeah, agents, yeah. the people you, you name, um, let me rephrase this. When you're creating and signing a financial power of attorney, um, they're done differently. Every lawyer might have a different way of drafting. There is a statutory form. You know, they're, they're forms that um, are kind of pre-populated. When I draft a financial power of attorney, so I'm speaking for me only, you could name as many people as it makes sense to name. So I always like to have, for sure, you want a backup. And if you can name three in, in a row, that's fantastic. Some clients or some people want to name co-trustees. So they say our two sons together are going to be, sorry, co-trustees or co-agents. 
that is workable as well. It's not my first choice, quite honestly. I, I find it's a little cumbersome. Um, we might say, because this is what the, you, you want, you, you say, you know, either of them can sign a check. I don't need both of my sons to sign every single check. The bank may disagree with that. And the bank might say, we don't care how, you know, what you say. Our internal policies are because we don't want the liability of one writing a check and the other not knowing about it and then blaming the bank for, for not doing due diligence. So the bank itself may very well require two signatures if you have co-agents. So when you're thinking about who to pick as an agent, um, geography can be, so there are all kinds of priorities, right? So in our perfect world, you've got an agent who is very available, who lives close by, who has no, um, you know, isn't going through bankruptcy, isn't going to be tempted by having easy access to your bank account, um, is a good communicator. So if you've named your elder son and others in the family should know what's going on for lots of good reasons, does that elder son communicate well with those other family members or neighbors or whoever it is or financial advisors? Um, younger is good. Um, although if you just, you trust your sister today and that's who you want today, do think of a backup plan. You know, it's, it is okay to name your sister today, um, but it may, you know, maybe there's a niece or a nephew or somebody else in mind as a backup. Another backup to consider, there are private professional fiduciaries. You can um, interview and appoint somebody to serve in that role as well. So that is always a, a viable option. Um, okay. going to the question now. So that was, can you write checks from a non-trust account? Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, again, a couple answers to that. So my, my legal answer as wearing my lawyer hat is yes, absolutely. Uh, um, so that, that's the first answer. The second answer is I would want to read that particular financial power of attorney. Does it, omit certain powers? Does it specifically allow check writing privileges? So what does the power of attorney itself say? And then the third, is it third or fourth? Third answer, third response is, I highly, highly recommend that you check with your particular bank. Financial institutions very often will have their own specific power of attorney for their institution. So I might have drafted the most perfect financial power of attorney for a client and they bring it to their bank and the bank says, we don't care. Our name is not on it. We want ours that our own legal department has created for our purposes. And I don't think that's a conflict. You just want to make sure if you're signing the financial institution's power of attorney, that it's not canceling out, that it's not revoking the other general power of attorney that you have for other purposes. So make sure whatever you're signing, or if you are the, the, the supporter, you're the agent, that you know what it is um, you can do and not do. We have a few more questions. Um, and this is a good one because I think people get confused by terms. So Robert Shaw has asked, is there a difference between a durable power of attorney and a financial power of attorney? And I think that's where sometimes the way we put together the language is confusing. Yeah, thank you for that question. So the legal term in our current pro, the current probate code term, it is called a financial power of attorney. Durable means that it's going to last for your lifetime unless you decide to revoke it. So durable just means it goes on and on. It doesn't lapse at any point. Um, it's a bit confusing in, goodness, I don't know how long ago, but um, it, it used to be that you'd sign a power of attorney and it would lapse automatically after I think six years. And so you had, to, you had to keep redoing them. That is not the case anymore, but the term durable has just lasted. So sometimes people say the POA or the power of attorney or the financial power of attorney. For my purposes, I call it financial power of attorney to distinguish it from the medical directive, which is sometimes called medical power of attorney. I don't want those mixed up. Those are two different documents. Okay. And let me just see. And then do you need to provide, let's see, a copy of the 
financial power of attorney to all entities that the FPOA designee has to engage? Um, so as far as providing that document, um, I think it's, if it, because you're here, I think, you know, you all on this, on this meeting, you, the Zoom, you are, you're planners. So you're thinking ahead. I think it's going to make um, that future life much easier when that, when the power of attorney is needed to already know ahead of time, if it's going to work or not. So you don't legally have to share it ahead of time, but um, I think it's a good idea to do so. Um, when it's needed, of course, the, the bank or the financial institution gets a copy at that point. And I'll just mention this now so I don't forget <clears throat> in the future, if you've created these documents, um, or if you are thinking about creating these documents, the power of attorney, make sure whoever you've named knows that you are appointing them. Um, if they say, you know, I really, it's such an honor that you've considered me, I can't possibly do it. I've got all this stuff going on in my life better that you know it now ahead of time. And once you've signed the documents, you don't necessarily have to give your agents copies of everything, but depending on who you've picked and, and your, you know, the situation, it's a good idea to get, you know, I err on the side of communication. I think they, they should have a copy or at least know where to get a copy. And if you know you've been appointed an agent, so if you're here, you know, on that side of this, make sure you know either where to get the documents or that you have a copy ahead of time. Okay, and we have, uh, we have two similar questions, but I'll read you them one by one. Um, this is from Pearl. What happens if I become incapacitated and don't have a financial power of attorney? So it depends on the assets and the decisions that need to be made. Um, the, and actually perfect segue. So this next slide that I just pulled up here is, is what could happen. Um, for me, what, in my planning world, one of the worst is, a, is the conservatorship. That's when a judge would step in, a probate judge, and um, decide what can be done or not done. So conservatorship, you've probably heard the term, it's a similar process to a guardianship for a minor child. It's when a judge is saying, this adult needs help, cannot manage um, her financial affairs anymore for some reason, or is at risk, um, is in danger. And so I, the judge, am going to put somebody in control. So, so conservatorship is a possibility. Um, the bills may not get paid. Um, in COVID, I think I've seen this more than ever in my career is, um, you know, if, if we can't get the information that we need or we can't get to banks because the bank isn't open all the time, there could be late fees, there could be, um, yeah, uh, bills not getting paid, or there could be additional attorney's fees that were otherwise uh, avoidable, preventable. Um, and uh, the loss of control, I think, is, is important. So I look at a power of attorney as I am not giving up control. I'm actually proactively choosing the person or people who I want to act for me, again, to be my ears, my, my voice, my hand. Um, and I get to make that decision. I'm not giving that decision to a judge or you know, a well-meaning stranger or a doctor. I, I, I'm, I'm proactively making that decision myself. It, can you talk, Deborah, about um, the concept of activating the DPOA? Because uh, I like what you just said, that, you, that, that in a way we're all taking control of a situation when it might even be temporary that you're in the hospital and you're having surgery and there's a bit of a recovery and you just want to have other people act for you. Um, but people often get confused about when they have to activate a DPOA and if um, the, the caregiver for somebody who's um, had early stage dementia and is still involved with decision making, but it's moved on to a point where they cannot make the decision anymore. And it's obvious to everybody that they're lacking competency. Does that family still have to take that person to get evaluated for competency to, to now really officially activate the DPOAs or are they still active? Yeah. So again, go, you have to go back to the document itself. So and this would be part of the, the thought process, the, the planning process, as you're 
getting ready to, uh, to sign the DPOA, the financial power of attorney. So it could be that it makes sense that it be immediate. The day I sign that power of attorney, my son has power. He can act for me if, if he needs to and wants to. And, and um, if I'm making it immediate, I'm, I would per, say, have a conversation with him, make sure he knows and so that the expectations are clear between me and my son. So that's immediate. We don't need a doctor, doctor's declaration. Or the document could say it is springing. So it only springs into effect. My son's powers spring into effect upon a certain event. Um, it could be the document says he needs one doctor who's not related to me or him by blood or marriage to assess that I need help. And then an assessment would be required. Or it could be two doctors. Um, or it could be something different. So there's a, a triggering event. Um, so you have to see what the document says. Um, as far as the assessment, I think more and more physicians are leery. You know, they don't, they, this is something else that has come up in COVID is it's difficult for doctors to do that assessment. Um, as hard as this is for us or challenging for us to be on Zoom, I feel for physicians who are asked to assess what's going on with their parents or their, their patients um, in this format. It's difficult. So um, getting a doctor's declaration might be a challenge, but, but it might be a requirement. Depends on the document. Okay. Um, let's just take one more question. And I think what we should do is probably finish your presentation and then, and then open it up to other questions because we've, we've kind of uh, gone off on the questions and I don't know if we're, if we're going to be repeating things or not. Sure. But but there was um, another person, it was a similar question that if you have no friends or family to be your financial power of attorney, what do you do? And I think that's the um, fiduciary, I guess that would be trying to find a fiduciary. Yeah, so, and, and, and I promise everything that I wanna cover, I'm, I will make sure that I cover it you know, with the questions, but yes, so thank you. Um, if you don't have a, a friend you'd like to appoint or family member you'd like to appoint, the what I ask you to reflect on is, might there be um, a neighbor you would be comfortable appointing or asking to serve in this role? I found over the years that neighbors do the most amazing things for each other. Um, and that might not be the right fit, but that's just something to consider. Or maybe you don't have a, a direct family member, but um, the, the, the daughter of, or the daughter-in-law of, of a nephew is a good fit, or you know, there might be somebody else you haven't really thought about that might be willing and able and be the right person to serve. Or a professional fiduciary might be the right fit as well. Um, without you know, promoting professional fiduciary as, as a, as the, in particular, the one, there are many, many out there. They all have different skill sets. They have, they are, um, you know, the, the ones that you want to interview and work with, they um, are very well trained. They are bonded. They work, you know, they work with other fiduciaries. So it is something to consider as well. And I am going to have everybody uh, a session on with the fiduciary. I have someone that I've started to work with who I ultimately really trust and like his whole approach and attitude. So I will be doing a follow-up to how with the fiduciary. So let's just keep going through and then I'll go back to the questions. Yeah. So I think Paula, you'd asked me to talk about this as well. So I, I might've touched on some of this, okay. but the importance of flexibility. If we've learned nothing else in COVID, it is that, um, if you can be flexible, if you can be resilient, if you can look at, you know, wake up in, in the morning and say, wow, what is this day gonna hold for me? It's an opportunity, um, fantastic. So with the financial power of attorney, the springing versus immediate is what I was just touching on with that last question. Um, and, and as you're thinking through, is this something to, as, as you consider this, immediate would be, you know, I know my son and I know he is not going to overreach. He is, he's not going to be tempted by knowing he could get into my bank account if he needed to. And I know it's difficult. I'm not going to the doctor as regularly as I was three years ago. Um, so it might be difficult to get a doctor's declaration to determine my capacity. Um, or going back to that, that dog walking 
um, situation, um, I end up in the hospital and there might be something immediate that he needs to work on for me. Um, and so immediate might be the way to go depending on my situation. Springing could be, I've a, I'm going to appoint that private professional fiduciary to serve. I don't need them today and I don't want them to do anything today. So I'm giving a level of um, privacy um, before that fiduciary will be able to step in. But know if you've picked springing, you know, and it, the, the powers only spring into effect upon a certain event, in this case, the doctor's declaration, um, it, there might be a few days delay or some delay before powers kick in. Okay. Um, okay, well, I do have a question about what you just said uh, it related to, it's also a question in the chat. So can people download reliable forms from the internet, whether and know that they're springing or immediate and do we need a state form? What, what's the discussion regarding using the internet for DPOA forms? Um, it's a terrible question. I'm not a terrible question at all, but to ask a lawyer because I don't download forms because I have them. So, so I'm not the perfect, it's not that it's a terrible question at all. It's just a difficult question because I don't know the answer. Um, Deborah, but it's I, asked all the time, every, yeah. every session. And I, and I can tell you, I see when people come to me with documents, hey, Deborah, does this, would this work? There are forms that have been downloaded that work just fine. And I can reassure you. And if I say, if I see that it's fine, I will tell them it's fine. Um, but you do have to understand what you're signing. So if you want it to be immediate, you need to be able to read that form and, and make sure that it is in fact immediate. So that's important. Or if you know you've got a business that you're working on and you want to make sure somebody can step in and um, deal with your accounts receivable or, um, or collect rents because you have a rental, you know, a duplex, you have a rental property, make sure the power of attorney gives those powers. Um, your life, your financial life might be really straightforward and pretty simple. And you've got, let's say one bank account and you've got the power of attorney that the bank has given you and the, the, a very simple, straightforward form that would be statutory, one that you would download might be just fine. Um, let me mention now, so I'm, I'm thinking about it. Sometimes people are asking about uh, Medi-Cal planning, public benefits planning. If you are thinking that that might be something your future agent will have to do for you, apply for public benefits, that has to be a specific power given in the power of attorney. So the downloadable form, make sure it has that power as well, if that's something that could be a future event. So Paula, yes, the answer, the short answer is yes. It doesn't have to be a lawyer drafting the form, but make sure the form that you are signing meets your needs. Okay, and then um, th there's another question, which I think relates to all this. And I think this is a one, um, that does confuse people. So if you're married, does your spouse automatically have legal rights to make decisions for you or do you need the DPOA forms? It's not automatic. Um, if you're both on an account together, so you're co-owners, then sure. But um, if I have an asset that's just in my name, I have a bank account that I just with, you know, I'm married, but I wanted my, I, <clears throat> I wanted to keep an account separate. My husband does not have automatic rights to deal with that account. Okay, so, and I think sometimes uh, a question, people are thinking about this in terms of healthcare decision-making because um, usually the doctors will go to quote the legal next of kin if the patient cannot speak for themselves. And that's everybody where you wanna make sure you have it, your advanced healthcare directives, your post, all these other forms or just your own documentation of what your wishes are in that, um, your spouse and your loved ones know this as well. I, I think that helps. it's true. I know that's you know we're not talking so much about medical, but um, it it also is not automatic. So I, in my experience, physicians will look to next of kin, and if people you know, so the legal answer though is they're not supposed to, but they do. Um, but if if people are not communicating, or if there's a difference of opinions, that's when 
the power of attorney, the medical directive, the medical power of attorney is really important because right, you're giving, you're making the decisions. You're not relying on three children who might have differing opinions to come up with, uh, to agree. Right, and people are living together, partners, and don't have any legal documentations per se. And if things tend to go sour, or you separate, but you still haven't changed your documents, there are then problems. And I think, so I'll mention it here. I think another time when I see having great or good documents, having these documents in place um, <clears throat> make all the difference is again, it's that, that misunderstanding, the lack of communication. So if you've, you're living with somebody or it's a, it's a blended family, it's a second marriage. Um, if you are unable to be that mediator and, and conduit of sharing information because something is wrong with your, your, unconscious, you're in the hospital, um, that partner, that new partner who's now in the home, your stepchildren or the partner's children um, need some clarity. Um, and if you can help with that clarity, that communication, you've done them a service and you're helping yourself. So where I've seen um, problems, just one example is it'll be a blended family, you know, second marriage and um, one spouse perhaps has named his eldest son as his agent and the other spouse has named in this case her daughter as as her agent and if both the spouses are losing capacity or have lost capacity let's say husband needs 24 7 care in the home wife doesn't maybe quite need it but husband's son has now hired help to help dad in the home, make sure laundry, whatever he needs is taken care of. Wife is getting some benefit from that perhaps. So we wanna make sure that the husband's agent and the wife's agent communicate and they're clear about who's paying for that care. And um, is it all husband? And, and yes, wife gets the benefit. So these documents, um, it makes it's important that again you've named people who can communicate with each other and um, and work together and that you've given them the direction that you want them to have. <clears throat> when to make changes are also is equally important. So I kind of I talked about that. So if you're naming somebody as your agent, my eldest son, if I see that he's not doing so well at work, he's gotten to, involved in a relationship with somebody who's a spendthrift. <laughs> and I'm going to get a cough drop. Um, I may need to change my documents. So don't think that just because you've draft, you've you've signed documents years ago, that they're exactly as you want them to be today. So do do revisit your documents since you're here thinking about this topic. Um, yes. Yeah. Go ahead and talk about. Um, so we do have another question, and it's. Um, it's interesting. Can the financial power of attorney be all encompassing? Can it include all finances? Um, I think, again, the, the lawyer's answer is it depends on what those financial decisions are going to be. So if you have a trust, <clears throat> then no. It, it, the financial power of attorney has a specific purpose, but it won't be all encompassing. Um, so it depends on your, your assets, your accounts, and the likely financial decisions that will have to be made in the future. So it could be all encompassing, but probably unlikely. Okay. Um, and then going back another time that you want to potentially revisit your document, your financial power of attorney, over the years since you last signed your power of attorney, <clears throat> has anything changed? Are you know, I, I have clients who still have Washington Mutual identified as an account, which of course has changed and changed and changed. So make sure that the financial institutions, that either you as the principal in my document or you as the agent are revisiting um, accounts, the assets, 10 years ago, public benefit planning might not even have come on the on your radar as being important, but today you might that might be something you're considering. So 
that's a, a time to revisit this. I have a question about change, when to make changes. And this comes up all the time for me. It comes up in the caregiver groups uh, on the information line when, when people call in. Oh, here we go, the caregiver slide. Um, and I'll just, and maybe this will get us into it a little bit more. So the uh, caregiver, let's just say it's the wife and the husband's cognitive status has changed. Does she have to tell him that she's changing her own durable power of attorney and taking him off and putting some, you know, and rearranging that? Uh, um, the legal answer is no. Um, the more complex answer is um, that if an attorney has represented both husband and wife, you know, which is very, very, very typical, it's almost, it's what you would most likely do. It, there could come a time when the attorney says, I, and the wife says, you know, I'm going to take my husband off. The attorney may say, I can't do that for you. I've always represented both of you. I cannot change this document for wife only. Or the attorney might say, I first need a capacity declaration from your husband or from your husband's physician to explain why he can no longer participate, why he needs to be replaced so that you wife, you know, you get the support that you need. Um, so that, that depends on the attorney and on the situation. And then of course, um, the, the, the layering of that is I never want legal documents or legal decisions, if at all possible, to, to undermine relationships and communication, right? So you, it might be better for the wife to not tell the husband because that would cause stress, or it might be better for the wife to say, okay, these are the things that we're gonna be doing together, but these are things that, that I will be doing with, with our son now. Um, I can say there's no perfect, scenario right but but i'll just add if i'm having a conversation if if i'm meeting with husband and wife and we're talking about this and um it could be very well that the, the husband in this scenario brings up you know i just got a, a dementia diagnosis i i know i got that diagnosis and i'm starting to be for, forgetful the conversation might be all right to, to the husband you know do you trust your son? Do you trust your wife? Let's work on this together. So there could still be an opportunity to work together to make the best decisions, to remove husband, but with his um, involvement. Right, okay. Um, why don't you go ahead and go with your slide here and then I'll, I'll I have questions. Sure, so I think a lot of people here who are, who are who've joined are in the caregiver role. Um, <clears throat> So some of the concerns that I hear often that I think we haven't talked about already, um, what if I can't act? What if I've said I could do it? And of course I wanted to do it, but something's wrong. So again, that goes back to making sure there's a backup plan. You are not legally obligated to serve as an agent. If you just cannot do it for whatever reason, there could be lots of reasons, you can resign, you can decline, you can say, I, I can't do this. Um, but depending on the documents, if, if you know, so let's say, um, my sister has appointed me as her agent for financial matters, and I know I'm in line to be her agent, and I know she's incapacitated, and I don't do anything, I could then be liable. So I proactively do need to do something. But if I don't know, if she didn't tell me, I'm not legally obligated, I don't have any liability if I didn't know that I was supposed to do something. Um, once I'm appointed, I want to make sure I have the direction that I need. Um, I was talking to a client this morning who's was joined by her brother and her long, long, long time friend, and they're going to be stepping in. And the question, the line of questioning was, really a lot about the, the caregiving support that this client was getting or has got for many years and what um, she still wants in the future. Um, she has personal items she wants to make sure are sold and she's providing, I don't know, the, the, the museums and the, the, the people who know how to sell certain items in her home. So they are all communicating about what's important to her and what might be needed in the future. Um, finding passwords has become one of the worst things that I think we do. Um, it's 
can be very stressful if if you know you're supposed to act and and deal with um, I don't know you know a, a, an annuity or a bank account and you can't get access to that account. Um, so proactively do talk about passwords or at least where those banks are so um, you can act in the future. Um, sometimes an attorney has to get involved, not always, or, or a court has to get involved, hopefully not always. Um, so a lot of this you can do with, without attorneys, certainly without the court, but sometimes an attorney can just a consultation perhaps can smooth things over and then, then the, the family, the agent, whoever can, can go off and do what he or she needs to do. Um, so, and, and then taxes and costs, there, there are costs. Um, make sure that you have the ability to get reimbursed if you're an agent, if you're a caregiver. You don't wanna be personally responsible. You, you, you do this, but you don't wanna be out of pocket unless, unless it doesn't matter to you. All right, any, any other caregiving concerns that you hear, Paula, regularly? Um, <laughs> I do hear them regularly. Um, <laughs> And and they're and they're varied. It just depends on each family dynamic and configuration and situation. But the one thing that I do hear and I've heard recently is that um, if you do have somebody who's in a cognitive decline but acting out, and they're either acting out financially, being giving money away online or meeting people online, and they're not yet declared um, either having been diagnosed. As having a dementia, but but and because the family's been trying to take care of them and just be kind and not put them through all the evaluations, or they've not wanted to go to a doctor and they've lost insight. So what do you, what really recourse do you have when somebody is starting to um, have access to the computer? Uh, thousands of dollars disappear. There are strangers knocking on the door, and and everybody. Yeah, I've heard these stories. This this does happen. Um, yeah. It happens with a, a type of dementia called frontotemporal lobe dementia, where people appear at times be lucid and fine and then have memory loss but then act out impulsively that that's a, a typical uh symptom of frontal temporal lobe. and then all of a sudden i get a phone call and i'm not quite sure what to tell them to do about the legal aspect of how to protect the money so they meaning the the caregiver the son the <clears throat> nephew the spouse or, right yeah um it's it's the worst you know i think probably the worst scenario that that i deal with as um as a planner and i think paula you also it's um so sometimes it has to get worse before it can get better that and it's such a terrible answer but sometimes that's what happens um other times we um you know i, I always want to make sure i'm not at all giving advice or, or direction that sounds um you know, I wouldn't want this, I wouldn't want somebody to do this to me. So, so I always take this, I, I observe the situation first, right, to make sure, let's say it's um, kids are coming in, or the spouse is coming in, and this is real, it's real, they're really worried. Um, the husband should, in this case, the husband shouldn't be driving anymore, um, and won't stop. So sometimes we have to, you know, cut whatever the, we, we have to disable the car or we remove it from the premises. Um, so it's just not a temptation anymore. Um, or if um, we, we, we may, uh, as an attorney, I can't call adult protective services. I'm not allowed to unless my client tells me to do so, but there are a lot of other mandated reporters. So it could be that a bank officer is told this is what's going on, the bank will call adult protective services, um, is mandated to do so, right? And Paula, I don't know if you are or not, but doctors are, clergy members are. Um, so you can always use that as, as an option and, and that doesn't always help stop that bleeding, but it could. Um, you can change, if you really, really had to, you can try changing a bank account. You can move the money. If Certainly if you're on, as, as if you're a spouse and you're on, leave that bank account alone with $10 in it, but move the money to another account that's protected. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, a lot of the, um, most recently because of COVID and everybody on lockdown, a lot of the phone calls were about um, computer access and what legally can I do to, um, you know, to prevent this from happening. And it's true if you have a, if you're a marital state and you're on each other's forms and documents, that's 
that's an easy answer. Um, but if you but if you haven't done the proactive planning, then this is where the problems uh, develop, and and one needs to um, to to really be proactive. If you, if the people on board listening to this have not yet done any of this, this is why this is why we're having this conversation to prevent you from experiencing this. I mean, I've got somebody now who um, called me. He flew across country. He's on the east coast. He had to come here for a mom. She's ninety two. And yes, money is disappearing. People are knocking on the door. She's been living alone and she's starting to change. And she's um, an older person who's refused to go to a doctor. And now they're trying to deal with uh, the, the situation. So, so this, this is a conversation that's ongoing, has multiple <laughs> tangents to it, but I, I do want to um, keep going. We've got some other questions here, sure. um, but, but I'm gonna hang on with this question. So what, Anything else about the caregiving? Sure. So um, I've had three, just in the last 10 days, three real life uh, examples <clears throat> of, of this exact situation. And so, um, and I try and think, what could we have done differently? Um, in one situation, um, this woman is, um, she's, she's losing capacity. She's also losing her home. She has stopped paying her bills, um, her mortgage they, they've threatened to put her home into foreclosure and um, she refused early on to sign powers for years, sign power of attorney, but people in the family kept bringing her back to me. And finally, um, last week, I, I said, I can't do this anymore. And um, the family tried to get an emergency conservatorship. Um, the judge felt it wasn't bad enough and said no. And this woman is, is going to be losing her home. And I'm not sure what the family will do. So proactively, like I said, signing a document like a DPOA isn't losing control. It's putting people in place for that moment in that future when you aren't able to make these decisions anymore. You are proactively saying, do this for me. I want you to do it. Um, so um, so not again, not a perfect answer in this moment this week, but the, it would have made a difference had she done this years ago or even last year. So, go ahead. There's some questions here about language, um, if we're going to move on now. Um, so I think there's confusion about the, the trust, and that's kind of an umbrella term of a lot of documents being in it, correct? And the DPOA or the FPOA, is that always part of the trust, having the, the durable powers of attorney and the advanced directive? When we talk, say the word trust, do we assume all these different documents are in a trust? Ah, so no, um, an entire estate plan will include certain documents. Each document has its own uh, job. It, it has its own purpose. Um, not everybody needs every single document, which gets confusing. So the way I look at a trust, so again, going back to the power of attorney only works while we're alive. The healthcare directive also only works while we're alive. Once I've passed away, nobody has, nobody with, if it's just a power of attorney, nobody has authority to deal with my financial affairs because I'm gone. Power of attorney stops. Um, so then the next layering in of giving some direction is I sign a will. I don't have that slide up because that's not what we we're focused on, but a will, if I have a will alone, and I say at my death, my, my will is giving direction. Fine, it's giving direction, but it only works if it goes through the probate court system. Otherwise a will has no force. So if, if right, if, if I, if, I don't know, my son survives me and all I have is a will and I say everything goes to you, to my son, and he brings that will to a bank, the bank's gonna say, who are you? We need a court order from the, a probate judge. So a will has limitations to what it does and doesn't do. So then we layer on, do we need a trust? If you, most likely, if you have real estate, if you have brokerage accounts, um, investments, there are always exceptions, but a trust gives direction. So the reason a trust is confusing is a trust, if you set aside for a second, a trust is a very long set of instructions. On the day that I sign my trust, I'm giving instructions most likely to myself. And I'm telling myself, do whatever you wanna do, Deborah. You spend your money, you invest, 
go on vacation, your business, nobody else cares and it's nobody's business. The trust then jumps forward and it has triggering events that give different directions. So the trust will say, if Deborah is incapacitated as determined by a doctor, now her son steps in and manages things, but Deborah's still alive. So she's still the, ben I'm still the beneficiary. So the trust is giving those directions to my son to take care of me. The trust then jumps forward again, says I've passed away and everything goes to my two sons. So my son who's the trustee um, is following my direction to make sure everything that's contained in that trust ends up going to him and his brother. So trust has lots of different uh, tasks. Power of attorney is very specific. They'll overlap. Does that okay, answer that the helps. question? The, the question simply was um, that if you have a trust, the financial power of attorney is, is not all incompass, incompassing. So that's true. We, we have to think about these durable powers of attorney only helpful for us while we are alive. They're, they're, they're moot once we die. So it's yes. important if you do have property and a large family and multiple things to consider that you're going to need both. You're going to need to do um, your durable powers, your advanced health directive, and also uh, the trust. And things may change in time, and you can go back and change them. But it's important to really um, to do to do both. So and, and just because you have a trust, it does not mean you do not need a financial power of attorney. You should have both. They do right. different things. Right, that's what I was, you know, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And there are, there's a, there's some person, more personalized questions from Chris and Marita. And um, I'm going to just kind of make them uh, not so personal, kind of talking about them in a general way. So if you are the caregiver for uh, relatives and you, the durable power of attorneys, and um, for instance, one of them does die and you have been, using your own money to uh, help that person while they're alive and now they are deceased are you able to pay yourself back from what they have or do you need to be uh, somehow a beneficiary in their will and their assets to pay yourself back so um the it might be fact specific as to how that this particular person is asking the question does this properly so i'm not going to say my general answer is going to work in every situation but the general answer is absolutely you should be able to pay yourself back um it should be specific for the work that you were doing the tasks you were doing as power of attorney so let's say um i i had to pay you know, this get my sister's, um, I had to pay her caregiver because I didn't have easy access to her funds and I paid a thousand dollars to her caregiver and then she passed away. I should be able to reimburse myself that thousand dollars because it was for my sister's caregiver. Um, where I see it going, there, there are examples where people are fudging and it causes trouble, but yes, you should pay yourself back. Okay, uh, I think my answer to that question, Deborah, is I think I'm going to give them your phone, your office phone number. <laughs> Great. I mean, that's my answer. And there are other attorneys here too, or, or if you have an attorney, ask your attorney because it's specific, but yes, generally you should pay yourself back. No, I, I, I do <laughs> give out listings. And also somebody asked about how do you find a fiduciary and, and um, there's a professional fiduciary association online and they're kind of listed by county and state and um, we can help you with that too. Yeah. But hey, is there oh, a way? Can I Go just ahead. add on that? Sure. Interview the fiduciaries. If you're thinking of picking somebody, Right, it's PFAC, Professional Fiduciary Association of California. Everybody's got different backgrounds, right? Some come from a more nursing home um, strength, some are bank officers, some have come to this profession because of family. Um, so make sure you know know who you're, you're interviewing. Right, we're gonna, um, I am going to do a town hall on the fiduciary uh, role and resource, and we're gonna cover all of that because there were many people calling during COVID saying who could be my decision maker, who can step in. And then there were people calling, saying things like, and I'm sharing this with, with everybody, um, just to kind of a red flag. Be careful if somebody is, an, is a fiduciary and a real estate agent, because there's a, a trend going on with an older person in a home and uh, the neighbors know this person's alone and people are very concerned. And then there's, um, 
interest in the house and the property, all of a sudden that person's getting a knock on the door. Somebody wants to buy their house. And oh, by the way, I'm a fiduciary and I can help you with the sales of the house and also making bill paying. And sometimes I get these phone calls from these concerned neighbors going, we, we think there's something not quite 100% about this. And yes, I am a mandated uh, reporter to um, Adult Protective Services. And I wanna tie that in since we brought it up that Adult Protective Services um, basically is call, will call or go out to first investigate and they try to find out what is going on. They have that legal right to knock on the door and talk to people and see how far they can get. I don't have that right. I, I will either coach you on calling Adult Protective Services. Um, if you're calling about somebody that I don't know, it's not my client and, and you know, explain to you how to make a call, but anybody can call Adult Protective Services with just a, a concern or a suspicion of concern. You don't have to prove anything or know that anything is actually going on. You just call, it's a call of concern, Google, Adult Protective Services, it's by county. They don't go in and just take people out and put them in a hospital and, and do these very abrupt things that um, I think there's a myth floating around about APS. They just try to, to figure out if there is a need there and if there is an issue about that. Okay, so where are we now? We're at. <laughs> so I'm on just questions now. I, okay. I don't have anything further that, but any questions I'm, I'm here. All right. So there are some questions here. So let me just see, get back to the questions. Um, good question. Is it best to designate the same person has the DPOA and the same person has the authority over the trust? Yeah. So um, again, in my perfect world, it's the same person. All financial would be covered by the same person. I think it's because there are as it's confusing because there are overlapping responsibilities. Um, it could be though that somebody wants a professional fiduciary in the trust, but they really want their um, sister to be agent for medical and for the financial um, decision-making. So you could pick different people, but make sure if you do that they can work together. So again, if, if it's your sister and a professional that they, can work together that the professional's willing to work with a family member in these other roles and that they can do it. Or they'll pick a, a trustee who's good at the big picture, who could sell property, who could manage investments, but who lives in Chicago and um, somebody else is right here in town and willing to and good at communicating and would be more appropriate to be the, the agent under power of attorney. So it's situational based, but perfect world, it's the same people. Okay. And then Richard asked, um, and sorry, Richard, I, I missed you as I was going through this earlier. Do you put your checking account title in your estate plan? If so, does this eliminate the need of the DPOA? Um, again, a couple answers to that. So um, some people put every single item they have, including their cars and every account, they title those assets in their trust, in which case, the trust will deal with all of those assets, the accounts, the car, everything. Um, the DPOA may have other purposes that are still potentially useful. Your retirement accounts will never be in a trust. Um, calling PG&E, the trustee lead, technically is not the person call, calling PG&E or dealing with, you know, um, I, I, oh, another really important, you know, I tripped, um, I, I need to sue the, person who didn't fix her, the sidewalk, that would be a lawsuit. That's DPOA. That's not a trust responsibility. Um, um, I think we need to go back to your, your concept that the, uh, the estate plan trust is, is more about after death and, 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 and there are things that we need to, that we want to do about regarding life is um, under the DPOAs. But some people, Richard, also um, with their checking account and bank accounts, they'll put the, a person on it, pay upon death. And that avoids, doesn't that avoid all the legal, the person just shows up the bank with the durable, with the death certificate and it, to claim it? Yes, so in certain situations that might be appropriate. Um, let's say you've picked somebody as a trustee though and your executor and you've made, and we don't have liquidity because you've, 
made the bank account, the checking account pay on death to somebody different, we could have a problem. So just make sure that everything you're doing fits together and it's going to work. Um, the reason I like, let me just say, the reason I like a smallish account left out of your trust is for a couple reasons. One is that for what Paula said, you might want somebody to have ready cash and you might trust your son to be on that account, but you don't want him to be your trustee and do everything. So if that small account is outside of your trust, you can add your son as a co-signer or a co-owner if, if that was appropriate. Um, I also find some institutions, if I'm getting a check to Deborah Radin only, and all of my accounts are Deborah Radin trustee, the bank sometimes won't allow me to cash that check. They won't let me deposit that check because in their minds, these are two different people. In, in As a lawyer, I don't think that's correct, but that's sometimes their policy. So I do like to have a small account left out of your trust, ideally. The threshold, I know we're getting late, but the threshold for worrying about probate at death has just gone up last month. It's now, if we have in total, outside of the trust, and we don't have a direct beneficiary. So in this case, my small checking account, I didn't name a, a beneficiary on it. If it's under $184,000, we don't worry about probate. Paula's solution though, is naming a pay on death to that account avoids probate also, no matter how big the account is. Okay, um, one last question. And um, again, this might be one where the person will need to consult with a lawyer privately, but um, her, the husband has been declared incompetent for financial decision because of Alzheimer's and the lawyer informed the spouse that she, that she could no longer add anything to the trust. And, um, they wanted, it sounds like they had just bought an apartment and wants, and wants the son to be the owner upon death. And, um, if I'm reading this correctly, it sounds like they may need to find a different lawyer. Well, Adding to the trust, what you're describing sounds like amending the trust, making a change to the trust. Yeah. And that may not be the lawyer. It might just be because if the trust is community property, it most likely says both spouses together, because this is their document, need to amend the trust. Um, consulting a lawyer, it, there might be a way for the, the wife to provide for the son in a different way. I, I don't know if, if the property's in, in their trust or there there might, I think a, an attorney should review it. There might be some workarounds. Okay. All right. Well, I hope that answers. Well, um, there are a lot of really interesting questions and um, I hope we were able to get most of them answered for everybody listening. And if not, um, just so you, we know we will post uh, a recording of this on the website and both of our phone numbers and contact information are on the slide. So um, thank you, Deborah, for joining us today. Thank you so much. I hope I answered everybody's questions thoroughly. If not, you know how to reach me or Paula through me. <laughs> it's, it's, I'll just end by saying it's complicated. <laughs> okay, take care. It is. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.